important to understand when uh, and uh, you ought to think about getting some help uh, in dealing with these devices. And of course, it's important to understand how to use uh, devices and what the uh, technical skills are that are required uh, in uh, approaching these sorts of uh, problems. There are really two types of uh, foreign bodies uh, that we think about. Uh, the first are the typical uh, devices that are oftentimes swallowed by children, such as coins, batteries, small uh, toys. Uh, the fact that uh, edentulous people will oftentimes uh, ingest uh, food without chewing uh, or even swallow devices without even realizing such. And then there is the mentally impaired or prisoners who are sort of a special group, uh, especially the latter, who oftentimes uh, seek uh, secondary gain by swallowing any number of uh, weird and crazy uh, things that I'm sure you'll uh, have an opportunity to experience throughout your career. Uh, food impactions are primarily those uh, involving the esophagus. They primarily occur in the setting of esophageal strictures or rings uh, and the classic steakhouse syndrome that we've seen in patients with uh, Shansky ring are very typical. Individuals who are talking, distracted, maybe having a drink or two and take one bite out of a big hunk of prime rib and swallow it and doesn't go any further than that. 80% of ingested foreign bodies will pass spontaneously and you'd be amazed at uh, the size of objects that will oftentimes make their way through the GI tract without the need for any intervention whatsoever. Uh, the most common sites of food impaction or of foreign body impaction in the esophagus are in the upper esophagus associated with strictures or webs. And now in recent years, we're seeing more and more of these uh, problems arise in young adults and ad uh, adolescents who have eosinophilic esophagitis and have difficulty uh, handling certain foods um, when swallowing. Uh, the, site of the location of the aortic arch where it impinges upon the esophagus and can obviously lead to some secondary narrowing and of course the diaphragmatic hiatus either due to a Shatsky ring or to a peptic stricture uh, are uh, the most often uh, areas of uh, difficulty. Now, as I mentioned, some of the things that will pass without your uh, intervention whatsoever will surprise you. Here's an individual who swallowed no less than five radio batteries. And uh, we elected to uh, sit tight and not uh, intervene immediately. Uh, and within a matter of hours, three of the five had already made their way to the colon. And uh, within another day, they were all gone and expelled without any intervention whatsoever. Here's a gal who swallowed not one, but two of her uh, rings. So we went after these endoscopically, but we could only find one. And we're driving ourselves crazy, looking and looking and looking. And finally, we got another film, and it was already in the cecum. So in, within a matter of an hour or two, some of these uh, objects will pass right through the GI tract. Of farm bodies, uh, fish and chicken bones are probably uh, the most common things that we're faced with. Uh, medication packaging parts or even full dentures, coins, batteries, basically anything that can pass through the cricopharyngeus can obviously pose a, uh, a challenge for us uh, to deal with. How does, it, how does it present? Well, obviously if it's an esophageal problem, it will present with dysphagia. Uh, if individuals are having difficulty in handling their secretions or they're unable to swallow any liquid whatsoever without regurgitating or developing uh, shortness of breath or coughing or choking, there is a high likelihood that they have a complete esophageal obstruction and have to be dealt with promptly. Hypersalivation, regurgitation, fullness in the chest are also typical uh, symptoms patients will present with. If they present with pain, it's a little bit of a different situation. You're a little bit concerned. Uh, while it may simply be spasm, you have to think about the possible presence of a laceration of the mucosa or an actual perforation. So if you're concerned because of pain and the presence of a perforation, always, always evaluate for such. The site of the perforation may determine the uh, type of signs and symptoms you'll be uh, faced with. If it's proximal, uh, swelling of the neck or crepitus, obviously, is a very worrisome finding. If it's in the mid uh, to distal esophagus, individuals will present with chest pain, uh, odynophagia, uh, dyspnea, tachycardia. 
And of course, if it's below the diaphragm uh, in the stomach or the small intestine, uh, they'll present with peritoneal findings. So how do we diagnose this? Well, if you're ever in doubt, get an x-ray. Uh, plain films are what you start with, uh, and that's usually sufficient for most foreign bodies. But remember that fish bones, chicken bones, food impactions, plastic, and glass may not show up on a plain film. Make sure you get films of the neck as well as the chest and abdomen. And if you find any evidence of subcutaneous air or subdiaphragmatic air, it's time to call your friendly surgeon. If, however, there is no such uh, abnormality found, you don't, either you don't see the foreign body or there's certainly no sign of any catastrophe, and symptoms continue, then obviously you want to proceed with endoscopy. If, however, symptoms seem to have subsided, and uh, the standard x-ray is unremarkable, and you're not sure if the individual has perhaps passed the uh, food bolus or the uh, ingested object, you can consider a contrast exam, but always use water-soluble dye, not barium. Most important point is to recognize that uh, foreign bodies or obstructions that are just beyond the cricopharyngeus are oftentimes and usually best handled by either your thoracic surgical colleagues or your head and neck surgical colleagues with the use of a rigid scope, general anesthesia, in the operating room. Don't be a hero. If you feel like you can't handle this thing safely, call your surgical friends and let them deal with it. Can't emphasize that enough. Patients who are not having any pain but report difficulties with handling secretions, and there's no history of, the, of a concern about swallowing a bone uh, or something like that, do not necessarily have to have an x-ray, and you can just go right ahead and proceed with an endoscopy. So what do you want to know or think about before you do your endoscopy? Well, the object may appear on an x-ray to be in the stomach, but you can get fooled. And if you're not sure, based upon the plain film, where this object is, consider doing a CAT scan. I'm giving you a couple of examples of this. I mean, here's a guy who took a key, swallowed a key, three or four screws, and went, look, we thought like a, either a, a small razor blade or a, a nail clipper. And, uh, but they looked like they were beyond um, the reach of the standard uh, endoscope. They were kind of low. So we went ahead and did a CAT scan, and lo and behold, you can see the metal uh, sha shadowing well beyond uh, the stomach. Now, don't bother doing an endoscopy in this circumstance. Here's a nail gun accident. And we didn't know if the, where the heck this thing was. So CAT scan showed it wasn't even in the perineal cavity. It was in the subcutaneous tissue. And here was an extended unwound uh, paper clip that uh, was uh, thought to perhaps be in the gut that we could reach and pull out, but uh, when you looked at the CAT scan, you can see that it's well beyond uh, the uh, stomach, and this patient had to go to surgery uh, as well. So when you manage these patients initially, you want to think about a couple of things. One, it, what's the, what is the object uh, like? Is it sharp? Is it long? Is it large? If it's more than two and a half son centimeters in size, there's a good chance uh, that it may not pass uh, the pylorus and will obviously have to come out. Is it in the esophagus? Is it in the stomach? Or is it beyond? Uh, we, can, we used to have to deal with uh, legion, uh, entities beyond the uh, duodenum with surgery, but with new uh, deep enteroscopy techniques, we're able to fish out a lot of these things without going to the operating room. Again, remember that 80% of these objects will pass spontaneously. And if an object has been swallowed and the patient's feeling well and is asymptomatic and the x-ray shows it's beyond the esophagus, you can observe them and wait and watch and see what happens. So when do you have to scope them? Well, it's important to remember that any complete obstruction of the esophagus has to be handled emergently. If they cannot handle their secretions, they're at risk for aspiration. And so these are important issues to remember because when do you get called for these? It's invariably at 2 o'clock in the morning. 
patient has eaten dinner or has done something in the evening, they've got in the ER, they wait the usual four hours in the waiting room till they get seen, somebody finally sees them, decides that they have an obstruction, and then calls you in before you know it, it's one, two, three o'clock in the morning. So do you have to get up and get out of bed right then and there, or can it wait till first light and get to see them early in the morning? The answer is if they have a complete esophageal obstruction, or they've swallowed a disc battery that's in the esophagus, uh, or they have a sharp or pointed object in the esophagus, you've got to get out of bed and go to work. On the other hand, if they've had uh, an esophageal foreign body that's been ingested but it's not completely obstructing, if they've had a food impaction without complete obstruction, if they've had uh, ingestion of a sharp or even pointed object but it's made its way already into the stomach, or the object is uh, six centimeters in size or bigger and is above the duodenum, it's unlikely to pass on its own, uh, or if they've swallowed some magnets, while it's important to get the scope uh, procedure done promptly, it can, it can certainly be done within a 24-hour period. You don't necessarily have to do it emergently. Less urgent uh, endoscopy can be reserved for patients who have swallowed coins uh, or blunt objects that are less than two and a half centimeters in size. If the disc batteries reach the stomach, they'll usually pass without incident. Um, blunt objects distal to the duodenum can be observed. Uh, but if they fail to progress, you have to proceed uh, to either enteroscopy or ultimately surgery. What are some safety measures to remember? Airway management is crucial. Um, you should consider endotracheal uh, intubation for proximal obstructions uh, or if you think you're going to be going back and forth multiple times uh, with the endoscope or when removing sharp or pointed objects. An overtube is a very valuable tool. We have a Gardas overtube that U.S. Endoscopy makes that we've, we've been using. We think it's the best overtube on the market. Uh, and this is very helpful if you're going to reintubate many times or you're concerned about as you pull back uh, an object that's going to accidentally fall off, drop into the trachea, and then you've got a bigger problem to deal with. If you're in doubt, call your anesthesiologist, get the patient properly intubated and sedated. Always intubate and, uh, and use general or MAC, at least, anesthesia in patients who you know is going to have a long procedure. They've swallowed 20 different items. Uh, you're going to go back 10, 12, 15 times with your scope. Or if they have significant psychiatric illness, you cannot sedate these patients satisfactorily and uh, safely. What sort of scope should you use? For the majority of cases, a routine standard uh, diameter endoscope is, uh, is uh, more than sufficient. If, however, you think there's a large quantity of material, uh, especially with foreign body, with, I'm um, sorry, with food impaction, uh, you may think about a large channel scope because it's, more, uh, 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 e it's easier to uh, lavage suction and clear uh, the esophagus in that material. Again, I'm going to emphasize the need to consider rigid endoscopy by one of your surgical colleagues uh, when and if you have a very high proximal obstruction. What are some of the accessories? We're going to give you some examples and uh, things that you can use. And it's important that your endoscopy unit have virtually all of these devices because in any given case, you may use one, two, three, or even five or more of these devices as you deal with these kinds of uh, uh, objects. There are several different kind of forceps. Alligator, rat tooth, typically are the uh, generic type uh, that are used. I'm going to mention the Raptor forceps, which is a new forcep that has a very wide angle and great uh, uh, distal tip to grab and secure uh, certain types of devices. Snares, baskets, a Roth net, uh, grasping tongs, and, uh, and the, uh, the talon for, uh, tong is a new device that we've used uh, lately, which I think is a fabulous uh, uh, tool uh, for removing certain types of uh, impactions in bodies. Suction cap, the kind that you use when you're doing banding, can be very helpful in this kind of a situation, especially for a tight embedded meat impaction. You may have a hard time grabbing it. You may have a hard time getting anything around it. And you have a harder time sometimes if it's really a thick, hard, uh, uh, dried uh, impaction at the uh, distal esophagus and being able to shred it or push anything through. So we'll put a suction cap on the end of the scope go down to the meat impaction, take our suction button off, because if you take your button off and just put your hand over the hole, you're getting maximum suction. And put that up against the impaction and oftentimes dislodge it out of its embedded position. 
And now you've got something you can work with much more easily and effectively uh, to get it out. Uh, again, the use of an overtube in a variety of different situations is something you really have to consider. What do you think about when you decide what tool to use? Can I get it? Can I grab it? If I can grab it, it can I grab it securely? Is it likely to fall off as I, re as I re uh, remove the scope or remove the device? Is it safe to simply pull it out with the scope? What's the risk of mucosal injury if it's a sharp object, a pointed object? If it's hard to get in an online plane, it's going to come up sort of uh, at a bad angle. And what's the risk of an aspiration? If I drop this battery into the trachea, I've got big problems. So the shape, the size, and the consistency of whatever you're going after will determine what you use. Coins are best removed with either a rat, tip, a rat tooth, forcep, snare, or a net. We always recommend using a net for removing disc batteries or buttons. Food boluses, as I mentioned, you can use a cap. You can go down with the standard biopsy forceps if it's a soft bolus and shred it. And oftentimes, once you start to shred it and you're putting some air in to distend the esophagus, a little bit of gentle pressure will pop it into the stomach. And once it's there, it's gone and can be forgotten. On the other hand, if you can't uh, do that, you have to use some sort of a device. And we often find that the talon and the uh, net is most effective. S toothbrushes, eating utensils such as spoons, knives, are best removed with a snare or a basket uh, and an overtube. Sharp and pointed objects, such as bone, uh, toothpicks, uh, dental appliances, or needles, always use an overtube, and uh, forceps or snares uh, are most effective. Some special considerations. Again, the disc battery in the esophagus is, in, is a true emergency because if both walls of the esophagus come in contact with the disc, it will conduct electricity and lead to tissue necrosis and uh, perforation. Always use an overtube when removing a disc battery so it doesn't drop into the trachea, and the retrieval net is the most effective uh, tool. Disc batteries in the stomach, however, will almost always pass spontaneously. It's not nearly the concern about perforation uh, uh, or necrosis, and so unless they fail to progress or they're quite large, which is rare these days, uh, or there is pain, you can watch them and they'll oftentimes pass on their own. Sharp objects in the stomach, uh, use of an, a long over tube that tr uh, goes by the esophageal gastric junction is often recommended and is helpful so you don't traumatize the junction as you pull it back. A protector hood is helpful, but I've had, I can't find it on the market anymore. I don't know that it, it exists. Uh, you can sort of make one with a rubber latex glove and tie it on the scope if you want to. Uh, and always remove it with the sharp end, obviously, trailing. Magnets, remember, if they are down in the small bowel, can cause apposition of uh, loops of bowel and can lead to uh, tissue necrosis and perforation. So if you're able to reach them, reach them. Drug packets, on the other hand, are best not approached endoscopically. The risk of perforation when you try to remove it is significant, and that can lead to disaster. They should be followed radiographically. If they uh, fail to progress, uh, if there's evidence of an obstruction, or certainly if there's evidence of perforation, they go to surgery. If you encounter an esophageal uh, stricture uh, or uh, ring, uh, once you've removed the foreign body, it's perfectly safe to go ahead and dilate that patient at the same sitting, unless you've really been working at it and there's been a uh, really tough impaction and you believe there's been too much trauma to the mucosa, but quite frankly, that's rare. So you don't have to be afraid of going ahead and dilating uh, the stricture or ring after removing uh, the food impaction. And here's an example of uh, removal of a uh, impaction with the uh, talon forceps. Now this was a, what, what you think about you is that individuals take one bite and now they're obstructed. But in reality, that first bite may not even produce any symptoms. And they take two or more bites and they have now uh, a lot more in there, but it's not all in one solid piece. So you start to get down, you get down there and you find that uh, half the esophagus is filled with meat or chicken or what have you. So you start pulling things out. And this was a patient with eosinophilic esophagitis and we had to go back numerous times uh, uh, to get the uh, pieces out. And you'll see in a moment that these seem to come out with no problem whatsoever with a great deal of ease. And we didn't use an overtube here. We probably could have and should have, uh, but we didn't anticipate it was going to be this many passes.
But in a moment, we're going to go back down. And now we're getting the, uh, the mother load. Uh, and we can, you can see as we get to the bottom of this thing, the food here is really embedded pretty substantially. And uh, you'll see that we're tugging on it pretty good in order to get it free. It's, it's coming with us as we're pulling. And we're exerting a good deal of pressure here. And finally, we were able to get a good portion of it out. We actually had to go back down one more time once we got this piece out uh, to do uh, another uh, run. What about a safety pin? Here's an open safety pin um, that was uh, in the uh, uh, distal antrum. You would think not looking at the picture, but in fact it was. And we used the raptor forceps that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, it has a very wide angle and has very nice app apposition here of the two points that come together quite firmly and allow you to grasp things. So... It, uh, here again, of course, we used the uh, over two because of the nature of the uh, object that was swallowed. And you'll see in a moment that we get down and find the um, pin actually in a very nice position. It was angled properly and easily. And so we used uh, the raptor forceps, which you'll see in a moment here, uh, to grasp at, at its uh, base. And we pulled it back once we had it secure right there in the same angle so that it would enter the um, over tube in a safe uh, fashion without any concerns about mucosal uh, injury. And there's the, uh, the tube after uh, the pin after it was removed. What about these kinds of situations? Now, here was a um, uh, sewing needle that was ingested. And the x-ray was kind of ominous looking. And so we were not sure if we would be able to really uh, go in with a scope and, and grab this and pull it back out into the esophagus. And when we went down, we found, in fact, that this had perforated uh, through the wall and was actually embedded into another spot in the wall as patient went to surgery. On the other hand, here is a partial dental appliance that embedded this portion into the wall went down with a alligator forceps, pushed this aside, freed it up, then used a net and took the whole thing out and the patient did fine uh, with uh, some antibiotics, uh, although that was prophylactically, she never really had any other uh, issues. The Roth retrieval net uh, is uh, a variation on the standard uh, polyp retrieval net in that we uh, were concerned about the fact that we wanted the net to retain its shape and size so, so that we could use it on multiple uh, applications in an attempt to remove uh, either foreign bodies or uh, food impactions, especially within the esophagus where the walls were uh, kind of uh, close together. So it's now an, it's an octagonal shaped uh, device that uh, retains its shape and is very effective and helpful for the secure capture of foreign bodies and food impactions and uh, can be used for sharp objects if you add an overtube. So here is a retrieval of a food impaction. And from a technical standpoint, this, this impaction was kind of firm and solid. So we didn't have to pick it apart. And you can see there's some room on the side. So as you advance the uh, hub of the net, as you open the net, you can encircle uh, the food impaction more effectively and pull it back. And this was rather easy. And here are some other farm bodies. This is uh, the net being used to uh, capture a disc battery. 
Uh, again, by opposing the open net against the esophageal wall, you have some counter force that keeps the net in the right position. And then as you close, similar to what you do when you're taking a polyp off of the snare, you advance the hub of the uh, uh, catheter uh, as you close uh, the net to keep its shape. This was a radio battery that was easily removed. Uh, this was a uh, washer uh, that was removed with the use of the net. And you see you have it very securely so you can pull this out without concerns. And lastly, I think this is the last example. This is a marble, which is a piece of cake for these kinds of uh, situations using, uh, using the net. Oh, yeah, coin. Uh, coin. This is a quarter that we took out. Remember that not every foreign body we encounter is ingested through the mouth. There are some that are uh, entered uh, the gut in other fashion. This was a tropical orange juice bottle, the Tropicana orange juice bottle that uh, was inserted into the rectum. And this uh, young man went off to surgery. Uh, that's the uh, last uh, slide I have for you. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.